down the ages past, Allah sent his messengers to deliver humankind from darkness to light. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. That's also the ongoing mission of Islamic Research Foundation or IRF, spreading the truth of Allah's final message to mankind. Founded in 1991, IRF today offers some of the best services and facilities in the world for presenting an understanding of Islam in an objective and scientific way. Its programs are primarily focused on correcting misconceptions and promoting understanding of Islam. IRF also imparts Dawa training to Dais to aptly convey the message of Islam. IRF has one of the most modern studios producing programs presenting Islam, which are beamed regularly on many international TV channels in over 150 countries. Dr. Zakir Naik, President of IRF, reaching out across countries worldwide, from America to Europe to Africa to Asia to Australia, strives to clarify Islamic viewpoints. He dispels the many media myths and anti-Islamic prejudices propagated the world over by anti-Islamic forces. Dr. Zakir Naik is a medical doctor. He is acclaimed the world over for his spontaneous and convincing replies to questions posed by critics and skeptics during the question and answer sessions after his talks. He is also renowned for his verbatim quotes with references from major religious scriptures of the world. Dr. Zakir and other faculty of the IRF train many Dais in effective Dawa techniques. IRF's website provides free Dawa training material for you to download and become an effective Dai yourself. Dr. Zakir Naik's talks are available on audio and video, cassettes, CDs and DVDs the world over. IRF today is creating a change in the hearts and minds of millions of Muslims and non-Muslims worldwide towards a proper understanding and respect for Islam. Have a question or doubt about Islam and its teachings? Now you know, one of the best resource centers to get convincing answers from is Islamic Research Foundation. 5658 Tandil Street, North Dongri, Mumbai, 400009, India. Phone 2373-6875. Fax 9122-2373-0689. Email islam at the rate of irf.net. For more information, log on to our website www.irf.net. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, Mr. Y.P. Trivedi, the chief guest of the evening, Mr. Rashmi Bhai Zaveri, Dr. Zakir Naik, Mr. Chaman Bhai Vora, Mr. Dhanraj Salecha, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. On behalf of the organizers, the Indian Vegetarian Congress, the Islamic Research Foundation, and the Russia Foundation, I welcome all of you today to this morning's unique program, a public dialogue on the topic, is non-vegetarian food permitted or prohibited for a human being? It is being held in a spirit of friendship 
and understanding each other's viewpoints. I, Dr. Mohammed Naik, am the coordinator for this dialogue. Hence, I occupy a neutral position. It is my onerous duty to ensure a fair and proper conduct of this meeting. Therefore, I would request both our speakers as well as the audience to maintain due decorum for a healthy and lively debate, as well as a dialogue. Now we would have the past president of the Indian Vegetarian Congress, Mr. Jayantilal R. Doshi, welcoming and introducing the chief guest of the evening, Mr. Y.P. Trivedi. Mr. Jayantilal Doshi. Mr. Y.P. Trivedi, he is a very senior advocate in the Supreme Court of India and leading tax expert of Mumbai. His activity in economics field inside ex-president of Indian Mercantile Chambers and active members of chairman of many other institute, trade and industrial body. In professional field, he was president of chambers of IT consultant and vice president of IT tribunal and bar association. In political field, he is traders of Mahapradesh Congress Committee, BRCC. He is also chairman and director of many public limited company, Reliance and Dana Bank. In education field, he was location of matters degree in Lower and Bombay University. He regularly continues article of various simply in different papers and journalists. He has addressed a member of senior and meeting of Rotary, Lions Club, ETC, and Air India, and Doordarshan, ETC. Thank you. Now we have Mr. Dhanraj Salecha, president of the Rushab Foundation, presenting mementos to our chief guest as well as garlanding him on behalf of the organizers. Now we have our chief guest, Mr. Y.P. Trivedi, addressing our audience collected here today. Mr. Y.P. Trivedi. Dr. Zakir Naik, Mr. Rashmi Zaveri, Dr. Mamad Naik, Dr. Dhanraj Salecha, Chimanlal Vora, and friends. I welcome all the speakers and all of you here to this very healthy debate which is taking place. I believe that this should be the beginning of similar debates which should take place in the times to come. This debate or discussion or the clearing house of mind is probably in the best traditions both of the Hindu civilization as well as of Islam. In our mythology and our history, we have such instances of such debates taking place in the courts of kings like Janak, when people from various shades of thoughts, because Hinduism was never following one particular pattern of thinking, there was Bhakti Marg. There was non-dualism, there was Advait Mark, there was Charvaks who did not believe in any God. So all of them 
Janak king, King Janak used to assemble them, provoking them to debate, not trying to influence anybody, but inviting the thoughts and then leaving the debate to the people at large to make up their own mind. So that was the tradition of our Hindu religion in this uh, land of India. That was also the tradition of Islam. In the immediately succeeding years after the demise of Prophet Mahmud, Arabia was the place of learning, logics, mathematics, astronomy. All this was being discussed and the great scholars of Arabia imbibed the thought, made inquiries, and transform that knowledge thereafter to the Western world. According to me, the Renaissance movement in Europe owes its origin to the thinking of these Arab thinkers who were great stalwarts in their own time. We very often associate Arabia with thinking about Arabian Nights. But let me tell you that apart from the strides which they made in the field of fiction and some of the most imaginative fictions. At the same time, in the field of science, technology, thinking, logics, mathematics, they made great strides. That is why today also, in spite of all the achievements, the West is still talking about the numerals as the Arabic numerals. And this is how Islam also in those days used to think openly. This, that tradition has been continued because I believe in the realm of, realm of King Akbar. He also used to call people from all religions, even the Christians who came at that time, they landed on the shore of India, they were also called, and they were asked to explain what are the tenets of the religion. So this sort of a healthy debate is something which is an absolute necessity for the development of any cultured, civilized, and tolerant society. Dr. Vora said that he is neutral. Let me tell him, and all of you, I am also neutral. If I would not have been neutral, I would not have been made the chief guest. <laughs> and I do not wish to desire to make any final comment on the subject. But one school of thought I would like to narrate here, which I read at some place, that all those animals in nature who are grass eaters, the animals which are thriving on leaves, they have got bovine teeth. They do not have canine teeth. All those animals which are eating flesh, meat eaters, they have got canine teeth, what we call rakshi. Human being is the one species which has got both bovine teeth as well as canine teeth. So it is very likely that nature wanted this species to survive. Nature considered that these species, human beings, are the most important species which should be there in this world. They should try to contribute. They should try to carry my message and take it further. So they wanted, the nature probably wanted, this species to survive under all circumstances. Nobody can deny then the early Homo sapiens or Homo erectus, they were all flesh eaters. At that time, there was no agriculture. If you look at the evolution, as we now learn from science, it is only the advance, advance of civilization that people started taking to agriculture. When they started taking to agriculture and started growing corns, some of them became vegetarian, some of them remained non-vegetarian, some of them became the mixture of both. They also took vegetarian as well as non-vegetarian. And most of the non-vegetarian people today also eat vegetarian food as a part of their diet. I believe that in this aspect, when you are talking whether it is permitted or prohibited, we are talking about permission or prohibition by the religion. In this one aspect, Dr. Nayak, I would probably like to differ from you. I believe that it is not the function of religion to tell us what we should eat and what we should not eat. Religion should try to purify our soul, purify our conscience, talk about good behavior, lead us to the path of God. What we should eat, what we should not eat is something which the doctors should tell us, the nutrition experts should tell us. 
it is not the function of the religion to say you shall not eat garlic you shall not eat onions you shall not eat ginger because this is something if subsequently the nutritional experts tell us that this is something which is very good for your health which is very good for your survival which is very good for you to fight your diseases then certainly it has to be taken because these are the subjects in modern day science we have to grow up we have to think in terms of what is lying ahead of us we are entering now the next millennium 21st century so much is expected from us today only i was reading in one of the magazines about the forecast of nostradamus and nostradamus thinks that this particular country which is surrounded on three sides by sea that one country will come on the top of the world and are we going to go into the top of the world become a superpower by just clinging ourselves to some of the outdated notions for example yesterday so many people migrated from this country i was wondering in the heart of my heart what is it there is no scientific explanation all throughout all people with any basis of logic all people who knew something about science they were saying nothing will happen whether eight planets come in one line or they go zigzag nothing is going to happen but then all types of talks were there alang which was our largest shipyard that was completely forsaken and completely deserted i was told that for rushing to rajasthan i believe i don't understand why people from rajasthan are so panicky the marwadis left everything came here and made an empire at the same marwadis thinking the eight planets are there they ran away i was told 2500 rupees were paid for a bus ticket for going back to rajasthan and nothing happened so what is very important for all of us if this country has to go further if we as a nation has to make our mark and probably the destiny is before us we can reach great strides 21st century as i have always been saying belongs to india and pakistan both of them when they will come nearer and nearer they will be able to become the leaders of the 21st century <laughs> and if that is going to happen then let me tell you we will have to get out of these old dogmas what is we should eat we should not eat the doctor should tell us if a new scientific discovery is made and i have been asked that i should eat tomatoes because it fights fights the cancerous growth then i must eat tomatoes in respect of what but my religion tell me so i think let us go to the scientists let us develop for ourselves a modern mind a scientific approach then i think today or tomorrow the whole world is before us i don't want to comment on the or trespass on the domain of the speakers with this introductory remarks i am once again trying to point out i am absolutely neutral and i would like to hear the views of the learned people who have made research on the subject thank you very much thank you mr trivedi now we have brief introductions of each of the speakers before we get into the mode of formal dialogue program we have mr chaman bai vora senior vice president of the indian vegetarian congress to introduce mr rashmi bhai zaveri well today i feel very happy to introduce our uh, president sri rashmi bhai zaveri president of the uh, indian vegetarian congress i think uh, our uh, this public dialogue will become very very interesting looking to the introductory speech given by our chief learned guest vice p trivedi so let us hope for the very good dialogue now rashmi javeri is a charter accountant by profession he is having his own firm rashmi javeri and company they are very well reputed as far as the corporate sector is concerned and uh, he is a very good speaker as far as the religious speeches are concerned he is a master of many of the religious philosophies he is a very active member of the charter accountant society he himself is the member of the bharat jain mahamandal he is the founder president of the forum of jain intellectuals one of the very prominent institution as far as the jain people are concerned and uh, he is uh, very well connected with the kala gurjari also though he is very young at the age of 63 he is very energetic and he looks forward always to this type of dialogues and today's dialogue 
is really a very good one. And uh, I especially before, uh, by giving the introduction of Mr. Rasmi Javeri, I would like to thank the, our chief guest as well as our Dhanraji and our Jhakir Naik Sahab for having a very good dialogue, whether by principle a human being can take or should not take the vegetarian and non-vegetarian foods. Thank you very much. Mr. Ashraf Mohammadi to introduce Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik, 33 years, is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation, Mumbai. Though a medical doctor by professional training, he is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir removes misconceptions about Islam on the basis of Quran, Hadith, and religious scriptures of various other religions. He also uses reason, logic, and modern scientific facts to remove the misconceptions about Islam. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last three years itself, he has delivered more than 300 public talks worldwide. Dr. Zakir also appears on various international TV and satellite TV channels throughout the world. He has also participated in various symposia and such dialogues with prominent personalities of various faiths. I have been asked by many persons, why are we having this dialogue, this topic, these speakers only? I hereby clarify. Mr. Dhanraj Salecha, president of Rushab Foundation, once visited the Islamic Research Foundation office about one and a half month ago. He presented the Islamic Research Foundation kindly with a set of literature favoring vegetarianism. These included quotations from major world religions, which included quotations also from the Quran and sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which according to him indicate that non-vegetarian food is prohibited for human beings. After some discussions, Mr. Salecha proposed that a public dialogue be held at Patkar Hall between Mr. Rashmi Bhai Zaveri, President of the Indian Vegetarian Congress, and Dr. Zakir Naik, President of Islamic Research Foundation, on the topic, is non-vegetarian food permitted or prohibited for a human being? This would, in turn, enable the audience at large to know the different viewpoints of both the speakers and form their own judgment. Both the speakers agreed to the same. Just about five days back, that is this Tuesday, I met Mr. Zaveri, and he requested that both the speakers in their talk refrain from speaking on other religions except their own. Dr. Zakir, though being very ardently in the field of comparative religion, reluctantly agreed. Therefore, as far as the religious points are concerned in the talk and response of our speakers, Mr. Zaveri will speak only from the Jain viewpoint unless compelled otherwise. Similarly, Dr. Zakir will speak only from the Islamic viewpoint unless compelled otherwise. This in brief is the clarifying background to the dialogue. The format for the dialogue will be as agreed to 
and decided fair by the speakers. Mr. Rashmi Bhai Zaveri will first address us for 50 minutes on the topic, is non-vegetarian food permitted or prohibited for a human being? Then Dr. Zakir Naik will make his presentation for 50 minutes on the same topic. This would be followed by a response session in which Mr. Zaveri will respond for 15 minutes to the matter presented by Dr. Zakir. Similarly, Dr. Zakir too would then respond for 15 minutes to the matter presented by Mr. Zaveri. When five minutes are left for the conclusion of the talk or the response time, I would put before each speaker a late saying five minutes left in which time they are expected to conclude. Lastly, we would have the question and answer session in which the audience may pose questions to each of the speakers alternately on the question mics provided in the auditorium. Written questions on slips of paper would be given secondary preference if time allows us. Now, I would request our first speaker, Mr. Rashmi Bhai Zaveri, to present his address. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rashmi Bhai Zaveri. Before I start my talk, I'm really very happy that this atmosphere of brotherhood, it has really moved me. And I will request Dr. Jakir Nayak to come forward and let's have a gale lagja scene. The chief guest of this morning, Mr. Y.P. Trivedi, President of Rushab Corporation, Sri Dhanraj Salecha, the learned speaker, Dr. Jakir Nayak, the expert commentator and the coordinator, Dr. Mohammad Nayak, Vice President of IBC, Sri Chaman Bhai Vora, other dignitaries on and off the dais, my friends, brothers and sisters. First of all, I must acknowledge the dedication, the sincerity with which all the three organizations, particularly Islam Research Foundation, has taken pains in arranging this lecture. I don't mind and I don't hesitate in saying the entire credit goes to IRF. <laughs> Friends, the topic today is, is non-veg food permitted or prohibited for a human being. Any argument or any statement for that matter is always to be considered from a relative point of view. There cannot be any absolute truth, there cannot be any absolute statement that it is 100% prohibited or 100% permitted. So friends, let's see, as very rightly put in by Mr. Trivedi who started the ball rolling, that we will not speak only from religious point of view. Religious has to enter. You can't uh, uh, divorce it from today's subject. But I would like to speak on this topic that non-veg food is prohibited for human being from various angles. For example, geographical reason, historical reason, 
moral, ethical, and religious reason, economical, environmental, and ecological reasons, natural reasons and psychological reasons, and above all, medical reasons. It's a fact now well established that our actions are controlled by our thoughts. What we think, we act. And our thoughts are controlled by our diet. As we eat, so we behave. And that's why the topic is very important that we should choose our diet in such a way that our thinking is positive. In the word positive will include everything. And believe me, friends, not only all the religions, but the medical science has now proved that the food that we take, it definitely influences our thinking and so our behavior. Friends, there was a time when there was no alternative available, as Mr. Trividi rightly put. There were places on this world, and there are even now places where there is no availability of vegetation. It is simply not possible because of the extreme circumstances. But now the world has progressed so much that there is a very advanced system of transportation which is available to us. And any type of commodity, including food, can be transported from one part of the globe to another without any problem. Now that when we have got alternatives, we have to think about this, which alternative is better from all the angles that which I have described earlier. And that's why, friends, I am now coming to my topic proper that non-veg food is not permitted now at this point of time, not only for India, but for other countries of the world also. First of all, I will say that all Indian philosophies have stated that we should not harm any living being not only the living beings that we can see, but also those living beings which we cannot see, which are in air, fire, water, etc. But always there is a limit. It's very difficult for a human being to refrain from total ahimsa, total hinsa or violence because of his needs. So that is why. Lord Mahavir stated that at least you limit the essential cleaning, killings, but absolutely no killing for your own selfish motive or for your own needs of hunger, etc. And that is why under Jainism and most of the Indian philosophies, non veg food is totally prohibited. Now, this is a religious aspect. I will not go very deep into it. But the psychological aspect, the effect that non veg food has on our thoughts and deeds, that is the most important part. The learned authors, I will not now quote the names of the books and authors because that will take time. But I have got all the authorities with me. It is said that veg diet reduces needless suffering in the world and also preserves our ecosystem. See, when I talk about alternative, you look here, or you look at the wild animals who stay in jungle. They, those who are carnivorous, they will restrict themselves to meat eating only. But those animals which are herbivorous, they will never go for meat eating. Only human being is such because of 
some false notions, I will say. It is the human being has been both a carnivorous and herbivorous. As I said, if alternative is available, why should we go for unnecessary killing? The basic principle underlying this theory is non-violence, love, and compare is compassion for animals, birds, fish, etc. Because flesh food falls in not essential category, while vegetarian food comes under essential category. Psychologically also, cruelty, instant impulses, urges, basic animal instincts, impatience are all the necessary consequences of flesh food. By eating animal flesh, man will ingest all the animal instincts, the four basic animal instincts of food, fear, possessiveness, and reproduction. These are there in men. I don't say no. But they are the basic instincts. We have got a reasoning mind. We can rise above these basic instincts. We can control our impulses and urges and become, then only we can become super animals or super beings. Otherwise, human being and animals, there is no difference at all. But man has additional quality called reasoning mind, which is blunted by the influence of flesh, food, and man becomes more like animal. The scientific reason for this is that flesh is an integral part of animal body. It is full of tamasic value. There are three types of values, tamasic, rajasic, and sattvic. Tamasic, in short, is the brutal sense or brutal instincts of animal. A man becomes more like an animal, he is callous, he is cruel, he is ignorant. If he is eating the food that is the part of the bodies of the dead animals, the crime rate is higher, aggression in the natural co is the natural consequences of flesh food, it distorts the thinking and reasoning. It is not only a problem by itself, but it creates many other problems like increase in crimes, cruelty, etc. The virtues like compassion, sharing, self-control are obliterated by the import of impact of flesh food. If we insist on treating animals more brutally, then our behavior will also become less human and more brutal. I will quote one shayari that what will happen if this animal instincts is so embedded in our heart. What will become of men? Adami ki shakla se ab dar raha hai adami. Adami ki shakla se ab dar raha hai adami. Adami ko loot kar ghar bhar raha hai adami. Adami hi marta hai mar raha hai adami. Adami hi marta hai mar raha hai adami. Samaj kuch aata nahi kya kar raha hai adami. Friends, this is because the man has become an animal. He does not then distinguishes between whether he is an animal or a human being. Because this is the influence of the food, the flesh food that he eats. Flesh food is the cause of PMS syndrome, that is preposterous mood swing and psychological distortions. Thus, it is now established that if flesh food is the root cause of moral and spiritual degeneration. We at Indian Vegetarian Congress, we are working for important task since it will lead to a more humane world at peace with animal kingdom and with each other. We at IBC define a vegetarian as one who does not at any time or under any circumstances eat meat, fish, fowl, eggs, or any other type of flesh food. Vegetarian does not come from vegetable. Now, this is very important, friends. Understand, the word vegetarian does not come from vegetable. It, the root is, it is derived from the word vegetus, V-E-G-E-T-U-S, meaning whole, sound, fresh, lively. Nothing is more powerful than an individual acting out of his conscious thus helping to bring the collective conscious to life, that is what Norman Cousins said. 
And what does Albert Schweitzer has to say? Until man extends his circle of compassion to all living things, man will not find peace for himself. It is a man's sympathy with all creatures that first makes him truly a human being. Now friends, I will go next to the most important topic and that is the medical viewpoint. It's a fallacy, friend. It's a myth to say that we don't get enough protein from veg food. And that is why a man must have flesh food that is rich in protein. I'll come one by one to these myths. First of all, I will first give you examples of those strong animals, say elephant, say rhino. These are the strongest animals on this earth. Are they meat eaters? No. They are pure veg. Even if they die, they will not eat meat. Even then, they are the strongest. Take example of horse. We, call of, we talk about horse power. It's the most powerful creature useful for our purpose and that is also a pure vegetarian. And take examples of cattle, cows, bullock and other animals. They are not only useful to us, but they are pure vegetarian. My point here is that those uh, vegetarian animals are strong enough and they don't need any flesh food. In fact, if stupidly flesh food is given to these veg animals, what will happen? You all know about the mad cow disease, the syndrome called BEC. Friends, this BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. You know what happened a few years back in England? It was a result of feeding rendered sheep byproducts to cattle as protein supplement. These sheep were infected with scrappy and SE disease known for over 200 years. Now, if sheep food can make a cow mate, what do you expect the result on human being? Millions of innocent cows were killed mercilessly just because they were suspected to be infected with BSE and that too for no fault of theirs. But the stupid ways of feeding sheep protein on absolutely un unnatural diet for a cow. So is the case with humans. Animal protein is not natural for us. Similarly, millions of chicks were destroyed in Eastern Asia countries because they were infected with certain disease. Now coming back to healthy diet. I will quote from one Dr. Dean Ornish who has written a very learned book on how to reverse heart disease without surgery or drugs. And this book, my friends, is the best seller in America now. It has really created interest in the people of America and all over the world for that matter that veg food is definitely better from medical point of view. He has given two types of diet, one reversal and one prevention of heart disease. Both are strictly veg diets because he has proved scientifically that veg food is the best food for a human being. It not only helps heart patients but also reduces risk of other degenerating and fatal diseases caused by flesh food, diseases like cancers of colon, cancers of breast, cancers of prostate, obesity, high blood pressure, stroke, diabetes, goldstones. The Surgeon General of America has confirmed this in the report on nutrition and health. He has given certain facts for protein. Friends, we'll have to be a little technical about it. The protein is formed from building blocks called amino acids. These are of million varieties of which only three are critical for us, lysine, tryptophan and methiomine. All these are available in animals as well as veg, plant food. But when one consumes animal food, forgetting these three critical amino acids, one also consumes uh, unnecessary elements like cholesterol, saturated fat. Friends, these are the two things that are the prime reason, the killers for 
human being cholesterol and saturated fat now let us address the issue that is universally put forward that we do not get sufficient protein from vegetarian food and so we have to turn to flesh food for adequate supply of amino acids now this is a fallacy a combined meal of legumes and cereals legumes means dal pulses and cereals mean wheat rice etc you have to combine these two and you get a complete balanced diet which provides complete protein which is not different from protein found in eggs or meat but without cholesterol and animal instincts one diet one dietic association has stated positive relationship between vegetable lifestyles and risk reduction for several chronic degenerative diseases as mentioned earlier it has confirmed that veg diet is healthier and more nutritious plant food is totally free from cholesterol which is only found it is which is found in both but cholesterol is only found in animal products such as meat poultry fish and dairy flesh food is also high in saturated fats which are which our liver converts into cholesterol our body makes all the cholesterol we need now this is very important friends you must understand we don't have to we need cholesterol but we don't have to take cholesterol from animal food our body it's a wonderful mechanism the biochemistry the chemical factory of our body can manufacture all proteins all cholesterol from our own system three fourths of the cholesterol in our blood is made by our body it is the excessive amounts of cholesterol and saturated fat in the diet that lead to coronary heart disease the other diseases friends which i have summarized from various journals medical journals epilepsy infected flesh kidney diseases excessive protein excessive uric acid these are all the diseases because of the flesh food rheumatoid arthritis gout this is the direct consequence of uric acid found in flesh food degeneration of intestine decay in immunity system dr deepak chopra of america has stated that our body is capable of living for more than 100 years if we take proper care of it now look at the um, population in uh, north extreme north region eskimos now perforce because no vegetation is available they have to take flesh food and the average life of an eskimo is only 30 years all non veg food is devoid of vitamin c and vitamin a which is naturally available in vegetables avidin in eggs and other dangerous bacteria are responsible for many skin diseases such as eczema scabies leprosy etc now i'll give you a certain scientific facts one medical study has proved that there are less heart diseases in veg people than flesh eaters it second it's a well known fact that not only in india but even in advanced countries there is no full proof system of medical exam of animals before slaughtering thus diseases carried by them are passed on to the humans who eat flesh food friends we all know that like human beings the animals are also infected by diseases and they are the carriers of the deadliest germs and when these animals they die and one eats that flesh that diseases which were infected and uh, which were the part of the bo- uh, dead body of that animal is again inherited by us 9% of food poisoning cases 90% of food poisoning cases are in f- flesh food eaters when an animal or bird is brought to a slaughterhouse now this is a friend which is again it needs some explanation if you have visited a slaughterhouse or a poultry you will know this when the animals are brought to the slaughterhouse and when they know that they are going to be slaughtered the the pain the agony the anguish that runs in the system it gives rise to adrenaline the hormones which mixes with the blood and into the flesh now these instincts of fear anguish anger 
the sperole negative points are then becoming part of the flesh food and it passes on to the person who eats. And that is why, friends, I say that when one eats flesh food, he becomes more like animal and less like a human being. <coughs> I will now turn to the fallacy that eggs are necessary for growing children because they contain protein. As I said, excessive protein is more harmful than useful. And the protein that we find in pulses, in cereals, is much more richer and natural than the protein, the excessive protein we find in animal food. Now I'll give you the example of egg. Each egg weighs about 100 grams and has 170 calories. It contains 13.6% of protein as against that, any dal or pulse will contain 24% of protein, much more than the egg. Oops. 